we're going to pick up from here. All right, so we did the ham sandwiches example for the new reactant. So now we're going to do the same approach, okay, which were the, the, the same steps and use the elastic example. So here's the balance equation we had with the silver nitrate and the sodium phosphate. If you look back to the beginning, so the steps two and three, same approach as the ham sandwiches, but now we have to get these to moles. We have to determine the moles of each reactant that we have, and then we'll pick one and find out the moles of the other that we need. So I'm going to so hit pause, see if you can figure this out on your own. Find out the moles of each that you have, and pick one, find out how many moles of the other you need using the balance equation. Hit pause. All right, you're back from pause. So let me go ahead and click on this. So this is the steps. First thing we want to do is we want to get the moles of silver nitrate, right, using the molar mass. So there's my moles of silver nitrate. I also want to find the moles of sodium phosphate. So I have two grams of sodium phosphate, use the molar mass. So this is the number of moles of each one that I have. I cannot stress enough, don't just write moles, but moles of silver nitrate, moles of sodium phosphate. Step three is pick one of the reactants and find out how many moles of the other that you need. So I just chose the silver nitrate because I wrote it first. And from the balance equation, I need one mole of sodium phosphate for three moles of silver nitrate. That means I'm going to need this many moles of sodium phosphate if silver nitrate is a limiting reactant. All right, so doing that step there. I could have done the other one. It doesn't matter. Now we're going to compare these, and again, we have to compare apples to apples, so to speak. We have to compare the sodium phosphate to the sodium phosphate. Now, by the way, see, I'm very organized when I do this. It's very important when you do complicated problems like this that you're organized. You don't have to use my organizational scheme, but make sure that you are organized. All right, so ask yourself, hit pause, you know, hit pause, is, so, is sodium phosphate the limiting reactor? Hit pause. All right, back from pause, and you can see we have, we have, if you back up, right, we have 0122, we only need 00785, so we need less than we have, we have more than we need, therefore sodium phosphate is not limiting, that means the silver nitrate is limiting. So now the last step, if you remember step five, is we're going to take the silver nitrate, now if we back up, we could start at grams of silver nitrate, but let's start with the moles, because if we started with grams, the first step would be convert to moles, and since we already converted to moles, we'll just start with the moles of the silver nitrate, and we're going to go to the answer. All right, so use the moles to answer the question. Try it on your own. Hit pause. Now, you know, I'm not, if you just keep this running, I'm not waiting very long. I'm assuming that you're hitting pause and taking however long it takes you. I'm waiting about five seconds or so. So here, we'll hit pause and see what comes up, because I just wrote these down on the number. All right, so what we'll do is we take the moles of silver, sodium nitrate. We want to get to, sil I'm sorry, moles of silver nitrate. We want to get to the grams of silver phosphate, right? So we, but since we're already in moles, we started with the moles that we had, and then backing up, right, we had 0.0235. We take our moles of silver nitrate, we use the balanced chemical equation to get the moles of the silver phosphate. Then from the moles of silver phosphate to grams, we use the molar mass. Right, this part we did in the last set of slides. Right, now, there is another way, if you find that too complicated, right, Another way to do it is you could literally just solve it both ways. So what I mean by that is you could just take the grams of the silver nitrate and the grams of the sodium phosphate, take both of them all the way out to um, silver phosphate. So hit pause. All right, so we're back from pause. So what I mean by that, like I said, Right? Do it both ways. So, like I said, hopefully you tried it on your own. Give it 
to answers. So now the, the answers are actually on the next slide. I apologize. All right. So there's my starting material. So if I try from the silver nitrate, right, get to get to moles, go to moles of sodium on uh, silver phosphate, and then go to grams of silver phosphate. But I don't know if that's limiting reactant, so I try it also with the sodium phosphate. I take the two grams of sodium phosphate. I get to moles. Right? Then I use the mole ratio, in this case one to one, to get to moles of silver phosphate. Then I use the molar mass. And you see I come up with much more. So in this method, you just do it both ways and whatever number is lower. So you're not really finding the reactant until the end. But if you like this way better, then do it this way. It doesn't really matter. Okay. All right, so that takes care of limiting reactant problems. Well, I'm only doing this one example, kind of did two, but on Zoom sessions, if you want me to walk you through another one, that's fine. Homework 10 has some of these types of problems on it as well, and the book does a good job. The lab manual also, they do it a little bit differently, but they do it. All right, there's your answer. All right, the last part of this material is actually pretty straightforward. Um, sometimes we have to calculate percent yield, just how much do we get so we don't always get 100% when we do chemical reactions for various reasons. Um, and we're going to talk about some of those right now. So hit pause. Think of some reasons. Think of your lab. Think of, um, well, you haven't done some of the labs. It's a little bit frustrating. But uh, if you think of the separation of the mixture lab that you actually did in, in the room, right? you didn't necessarily get your percentages to come out 100%, right? What are some sources of error that you can think of? So I'm going to you know, hit pause, and I'll go through some that I like to talk about. All right, so coming back from hitting pause, uh, some things that are very common, and by the way, this is a big deal depending on industry. Obviously, in the industries, they want to get as high a percent yield. In the drug industry, it's really important because if you get if you do the same reaction, you get different yields, you're not doing the same reaction, right? If you do the same thing the same way, you should get the same results. All right, so one source of error, probably bigger for students, is oops error. So oops, I spilled. Oops, I transposed numbers. By the way, calculation errors are not reasonable to list because if you think you made a calculation error, you can always read it now. So calculation errors, no. An oops error, though, is oops, I, we spilled some, right? So while I was transferring it, I knocked over the cylinder and some of it spilled, or a loss during transfer, things like that. Those are oops errors, all right? And everybody makes oops errors. Obviously, a student, you're learning, so you're going to make more. But if you think about it, how many of you have never spilled anything since you were five? Of course, everybody spills things once in a while. Everybody transposes a number once in a while. I want to contrast that with experimental error. So experimental error is error that is part of how you're doing the experiment. So in the separation of the mixture experiment, for example, one of the questions at the end of the lab was, why did you weigh your mixture directly into the evaporating dish rather than weighing it into a, um, into a weighing boat and transferring it? Well, if you did it that way, you'd lose some during the transfer. So the method was changed, so we just weigh it directly. Experimental error is an error that's part of how you do it, and so the only way to fix experimental error is to change the way you do the experiment. And there's people called developmental chemists that they come up with, they develop the better method, and they'll look at how are you doing it, how can we change the way you're doing it. So don't, it's not the same as oops. Okay, contamination's a big deal. So uh, if you're working with starting materials that aren't pure, uh, so, you know, um, Again, you didn't do the zinc iodide experiment, but it, if, if in that reaction, uh, the zinc that we were working with was not pure zinc, so right away you're going to have some error. Um, yeah, contamination is a big deal. And you can deal with that a lot of ways. One is to start with pure starting materials. You can buy pure starting materials, or you can purify them yourself. Okay. Um, that's why we make such a big deal about not sticking pipettes into bottles. Side reactions. So a side reaction is... A plus B makes C, but we're trying, but A also reacts with oxygen. And so we get a side reaction where A is reacting with something else. So that, that's a side reaction, which means all of it isn't going the direction we want. 
And that's a big deal. There's a lot of things, for example, that will react with oxygen in the air. And so there are methods you can deal with changing your experiment as well to deal with side reactions to prevent things from being exposed to the air, for example. Um, and then there's incomplete reaction. This is also called equilibrium. You'll deal with this a lot more in Chem 201. But equilibrium means the reaction doesn't ever go to completion. So there's a reverse reaction. And that's not actually that unusual. So those are just some reasons why we don't get 100% yield. Now, uh, percent yield, the yield calculations, there's just some definitions. The theoretical yield is based on your calculations, your stoichiometry. That's how much you should get. So when you do the math, any of the problems we did, the silver phosphate problem, for example, that 3.28, I think it was, that was a theoretical yield. So it's calculated. Actual yield is what you really get. So when you actually did the experiment and purified the product and cleaned it out and put it in a beaker and you weighed it, how much did you really get? That's the actual yield. And the percent yield is the actual over the theoretical times 100. So just to look at a problem, uh, percent yield if 6.97 grams of ammonia is produced from the reaction of 6.22 grams of nitrogen. All right, so just learning how to read the problem. This is produced, so this is my actual yield. So what I need to do here is figure out the theoretical yield. So hit pause and try to come up with the theoretical yield of ammonia from this much nitrogen. So first write the equation, hit pause. All right, back from pause, write the balanced equation. There's a balanced equation. All right, then we can diagram it out. We can calculate the theoretical, to diagram it out, we didn't do it on this slide, but you have 6.22 grams of nitrogen and you want question mark grams of ammonia. So now try it with stoichiometry. You're going to be equaling grams of ammonia and you're going to start with 6.22 grams of nitrogen. Hit pause, try it on your own. And that would be the answer. By the way, this is not a limiting reactant problem because you're not told about the hydrogen, right? So this is just a review of stoichiometry. We're going to get to moles, so we use the molar mass of nitrogen. We use the mole ratio, two moles of ammonia to one mole of nitrogen. And then we use the molar mass of the ammonia to get to the grams of ammonia. So theoretically, we should have got 7.56. We only got 6.97. So the percent yield, right, actual or theoretical times 100, the 100 does not change your sig fig, so the actual was 6.97, the theoretical was 7.56, so we have a 99% yield. Okay, that's it for these. So you should be able to do all of homework 10 now, and you know I would have the slides handy while I'm doing it. You know maybe not the video, that's up to you, but I have the slides handy because there's examples. The textbook is really good, and again the big deal is writing the equations from words. That's not a trivial thing, so make sure that you're getting the equations right and use your notes on that as well. As I said, the textbook does a good job on this material, as does the lab manual. So you've got a couple of sources that you can look at. All right, take care.